Hi guys, Zane here, and welcome to my March reading wrap-up. Now, I'm going to do this one slightly differently. I actually can't even tell you at the moment how many books I've read this month, because I'm starting to film a little early, and then I'm just going to film the later bits later on, hopefully to give me a chance to do some editing, and to get this out reasonably close to the end of the month. So, at the moment, I have, uh, I have six, no, five reading days left, and I'm on 39 or 40 books. So it's, it's a new record. <laughs> so uh, you can probably see the reason why I'm, I'm filming it like this. But uh, without further ado, let's let's get some books going. All right, well, my stack of books has already gone out of order somehow, but we're going to get started anyway. So the first one I read was Rebellious Spirits by Ruth Ball, Audacious Tales of Drinking on the Wrong Side of the Law. And this is basically a non-fiction book chronicling the history of illicit brewing, specifically in the UK, although there is some stuff about America, because, for example, during the Prohibition, there was a sudden boom in illicit brewing in the UK to fuel America's need for booze, which is very interesting. Throughout this, there's also like cocktails, and the author basically gets these historical recipes, like some of them as far back as say the 1700s, 1800s, for these cocktails, and she'll present those recipes with, you know, giving you the source of it uh, in the original language, and then she'll provide you with like a modernized version with that, you know, different ingredients that are easy to get from your local supermarket. And it's just a really interesting read about the history of illegal brewing. You've got like smuggling going on. There was one great, there's lots of great stories to it actually about various kind of figures from centuries ago. And it, it blows my mind that they were even documented. And then there are things like uh, there was a ship that was bringing legal booze into the country. And the ship was turned into a wreck basically. And the, uh, the government didn't necessarily want to reclaim all of the alcohol from you know from this wreck because it would have been very difficult but they also didn't want it to get into the hands of the general public because then it could be sold and consumed without it being properly taxed uh so there's just some really kind of cool stuff in in this book and i would definitely recommend it i picked it up as a bedtime book and got so into it i read about the first 70 pages in bed and then finished it the following day and i would give it a you know four out of five maybe even a 4.5 out of five then we have Oscar Wilde, Lord Arthur Savile's Crime, Penguin, a Little Black Classic, number 59. Wild, supremely witty tale of dandies, anarchists, and a murderous prophecy in London high society. And I mean, it's Oscar Wilde. He's one of my favourite authors of that time. I mean, there are some other ones I really enjoy, like Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and Bram Stoker and that, and that kind of, those kind of authors as well. But uh, Wilde's just got this kind of inimitable style. And if you've read Wilde, you probably fell in love with him. And if you haven't read Wilde, you should read Wilde. This probably isn't the best way to start with him, I'd suggest. Maybe starting with The Picture of Dorian Gray, unless you're into plays and that sort of thing, in which case... You know, maybe the importance of being earnest or something like that. Did still enjoy this, so I gave it a solid 4 out of 5. Alright, then we have Little Black Classic number 26, Henry Mayhew of Street Pieman. Or, when I first read it, of Street P.A. Men, is what I thought it was. The matchless chronicler of Victorian Londoners observes everything from a surprise pie fillings to a balloon ride over the city. And this is kind of like a quintessentially British, quintessentially London book. You feel as though you're walking the streets, you feel as though you can smell the pies, you can hear the cries of the street vendors. And because he was writing kind of in Victorian London as well, you feel as though you're in specifically Victorian London. So it's just a great book to read if you're into that kind of time period. It is non-fiction. But it's just really interesting. Uh, another four out of five for me. Okay, here we have Hafez, The Nightingale's a Drunk, number 27. Spiritual, sensual verses on love, heartbreak, and celebrating life's small pleasures by the great 14th century Persian poet. And this one actually stood out to me above the rest of the poetry that I've read in this collection. I thought it was fascinating that he was a 14th century Persian poet and he spoke to me more than even uh, people like... Um, you know Samuel Taylor Coleridge for example so I'm going to read you some of the poetry here so you can decide whether it's your kind of thing I will say I think part of the reason why I enjoyed it was probably because uh, the translation was great and uh, <laughs> the translation was by uh, Dick Davis as well so great name cheers Dick uh, all right let's go into here all right there are no titles for any of these poems by the way although there is like a contents page but I think that just lists like the opening lines to give up wine and human beauty and to give up love no, I won't do it. A hundred times I said I would. What was I thinking of? No, I won't do it. To say that paradise, it's ours and it's shade and more, to me than is the dusty street before my lover's door? No, I won't do it. Sermons and wise men's words are signs, and that's how we should treat them. 
I mouthed such metaphors before, but now I won't repeat them. No, I won't do it. I'll never understand myself. I'll never really know me until I've joined the wine shop's clientele and that will show me I have to do it. The preacher told me, give up wine. Contempt was in the saying. Sure, I replied. Why should I listen to these donkeys braying? No, I won't do it. So yeah, um, yeah, four out of five, I think. Okay, then we have Matsuo Basho, Lips Too Chilled, Penguin, Little Black Classics, number 62. Japan's celebrated Buddhist poet balances the smallness of humanity with nature's epic drama in these magical 17th century haikus. I was always taught that the plural of haikus was haiku, by the way. And speaking of taught, that's where I was taught it on my creative writing course when I was at uni. Basho was one of the writers we studied, and he's basically the Shakespeare of Japan and probably the most well-known haiku writer. My only problem with this is that it's very sparse. So it's only got, say, four or six haiku per, page, uh, per two-page spread. And I just feel like they could have squeezed more in, really. But I'll, I'm going to read this double-page spread of them here. So, uh, mountain path, sun rising through plum scent. Another haiku, yet more cherry blossoms, not my face. Sleeping willow, soul of the nightingale. Behind the virgin's quarters, one blossoming plum. I should point out here as well that they're not necessary five syllables, then seven syllables, then five syllables, because obviously they've been translated from Japanese. But still, I really love Basho. I would recommend reading some of his work. I would just say get uh, The Narrow Road to the Deep North, to be honest, which is like his masterpiece. But um, if not, grab, grab this if you can, 4.5 out of 5. Okay, then we have Henry James, The Figure in the Carpet, number 49. James's troubling late Victorian mystery of an unsolved literary riddle and sudden death has inspired endless speculation. Now, I really enjoyed The Turn of the Screw, and so I was looking forward to reading this, because that's the only James that I've read, and unfortunately, I didn't really like this. I kind of liked what he was trying to do, and he did a great job at sort of setting this sense of time and place in this creepy, unnerving atmosphere, but... It just wasn't enough for me. I wanted more plot. I wanted more sort of characterization, a uh, better characterization. And I just wasn't absorbed into the story. I ended up reading this. Uh, this is when I sort of started reading these little black classics in bed because this one in particular, I just, I wasn't enjoying reading it. So I decided to read it like a little bit at a time. So I, I'll give it, I'll still give it like a three out of five, but I don't know. Wouldn't recommend unless you're a big James fan. All right, it is a new day. But we're going to crack on with some more of these uh, little mini reviews for the uh, wrap up anyway. So here we have Hans Christian Andersen, The Tinderbox, number 23 of the Penguin Little Black Classics. Andersen's bittersweet fairy tales propelled their troubled author to international fame and revolutionised children's writing. So if you have ever come across any of Hans Christ Christian Andersen's work before, you know pretty much what to expect here. Let me see what was in here. We have uh, The Tinderbox, Little Claws and Big Claws, The Princess on the P, which is one of my favourites and possibly one of the most well known. The Steadfast Tin Soldier, The Nightingale and The Red Shoes. And it was just, you know, a, a real delight really to read them. I, I've kind of, I'm familiar with all of these stories, but I don't remember ever reading Han Anderson specifically, but I'm sure I must have done. And it's made me want to, for sure, you know, get like maybe his collected short stories or something. So that's a, uh, I'll give that a four out of five. Then we have D.H. Lawrence, Il Duro, number 71. Sketches of scorched landscapes, peasants and wild spirits from Lawrence's travels in early 20th century Italy. And it does very much feel like stories of their place, you know, you really get the sense of what it was like to be there. I'm not going to lie, it was a little dull at times, but I do enjoy Lawrence's writing as well. So that kind of counterbalanced it for me. I'll give it like a 3.5 out of 5. Um, but yeah, I was hoping for more from it, I think. Okay, then we have Words as Weapons, and this is by AJ, Doug Lucy, Lucy Jacobs, Mary Bell, Peter Cox MBE, Rowan Padmore, and Tom Kuhn, and Rowan Padmore edited it. And, okay, so there's a story behind this, so let me try and get all the details straight. Basically, uh, I've met Rowan Padmore, I actually, we, uh, we were having a few drinks in Oxford, so she's friends with Bex. This was all done kind of in collaboration with the old fire station, which is where Bex works, and then, I believe it was uh, Crisis, which is a homeless charity that also shares the building with them. And so these are all done during workshops. And uh, yeah, I think it's an aid of crisis. It's had a little bit of funding, I believe. And uh, yeah, definitely recommend checking it out. I'm gonna read you a poem. Let's read you Glycerine by Lucy Jacobs. Sunny days glisten, fine as glycerine. Shadows are not seeking, if only for a bit. God only knows the true mesh you're in. I cannot help it, they tempt me to sin. 
I cannot help it, not in this kit. Sunny days glisten, fine as glycerine. Sparkle, it seems, is found in a tin that sickens, no doubt, and just muddies it. God only, God only knows the true mess you're in. Sullen and silent, pale and too thin, thawing the madness that marries it. Sunny days glisten, fine as glycerine. Misery makes its mark so akin, insidious seeping, it hollows, it sits. God only knows the true mess you're in. In prayers and penance, poems and sin, summer it startles the heart to commit. Sunny days glisten, fine as glycerine, God only knows the true mess you're in. So yeah, I gave it like a 3.5, maybe 4 out of 5. As like an artifact, it's pretty cool. And, I, you know, I like the idea behind it. Obviously, with poetry, it tends to be pretty hit and miss in general. And one of the things here is obviously these aren't like seasoned poets. These are people who've been to some poetry workshops, but from, you know, admittedly by somebody who I think is a pretty seasoned poet. So, um, you know, you're not going to get maybe, you know, a Kate Tempest or something here. But, um... Yeah, definitely some food for thought made it made it worth reading, I think. All right, then we have H.G. Wells, A Slip Under the Microscope, number 77. Disturbing prescient stories of human conscience and conflicting desires by the pioneer of science fiction. I mean, it's H.G. Wells, so I enjoyed it. Uh, I went to see The War of the Worlds, like a stage play kind of inspired. Actually, it's inspired by the uh, Awesome Wells radio broadcast of it. And so since then, I've kind of been on a bit of an H.G. Wells kick. So I read this and I have another one of his up there on my TBR as well. So, uh, yeah, I enjoyed it. I'll probably give it like a 3.75. It wasn't quite a 4 out of 5, but I don't know if it's necessarily like his finest work, but it is quite typical of him, if that makes sense. OK, then we have Tulipomania, a King Penguin book, and this is by Wilfred Blunt. And uh, basically, Bex collects um, King, uh, King Penguins. And I got a struggle to get my words out there. And uh, I actually got her some for her birthday as well, which will have happened by the time this video is uploaded. So I don't need to worry about spoilers. And she mentioned this one in particular because it's basically about a financial crisis that was brought about by tulips. It also has all these really beautiful illustrations in it as well. So it's kind of like a non-fiction book, but with these, you know, again, with these illustrations in it. And yeah, it was just excellent. Really uh you know, really different kind of book, I guess. And it's made me want to read some more of the uh, King Penguins, but they are also quite expensive. So, uh, I don't know. But I will give it a uh, pretty solid 3.75 out of 5, I think. All right, then we move on to The Blue Fox by Sean. And Sean is an Icelandic author. Uh, he actually wrote lyrics for Bjork as well. And I heard a lot about him when I was in Latvia last year. I'm going to read the blurb for this because there's no way I can like summarize this. The year is 1883. The stark Icelandic winter landscape is the backdrop. We follow the priest, Baldur Skuggason, on his hunt for the enigmatic blue fox. And just as the priest pulls the trigger, we are swept away to the world of the naturalist, Friedrich B. Friedrichsen, and his charge, Abba, who suffers from Down syndrome. When she was found shackled to the timbers of a ship run aground in 1868, Friedrich had fortuitously come to Abba's rescue. The fates of all of these characters are intrinsically bound and gradually, surprisingly, unravelled in this spellbinding fable that is part mystery, part fairy tale. And I really enjoyed this, actually. It reminded me of um, uh, The Alchemist by Paolo Coelho, except I didn't like that book, but I did like this one. But it had that kind of similar vibe and this sort of almost a kind of a timelessness, I guess, to when the story is and when the story is set. And yeah, I just really enjoyed it. It was quite short, quite sweet. Um, there's, it's one of those where there's like a moral to it, but it's not explicitly laid out. So you have to decide for yourself the deeper meaning to it. I think it would stand up really well to rereads. And I have over there, uh, From the Mouth of the Whale, which is another Sean uh, book, which I picked up from a charity shop. So pretty excited to get to that. All in all, I gave this a four out of five. Okay, then we have Tinder Nightmares presented by Uninspirational. And this is literally just a collection of little like screenshots of Tinder conversations with like a running commentary on them. So, uh, for example, we have here, uh, Matt. Matt said, I work for NASA. And the, the woman replied, oh? And he said, does that make you wet? And she said, lol, not really. Uh, Alex here, he said, uh, or she, possibly. Roses are red, violets are blue. Actually, it says, roses are red, violets are blue. You be the six and I'll be the nine. <laughs> You're so hot that if you ate a slice of bread, you'd shit it out as toast. And then they replied, the question is, would you eat the toast? And the Jeff said, without a doubt, I'd have seconds. So, yeah, it's like a 3.5 out of 5. It's good for a laugh, I guess. But um, beyond that, you know. Okay, here we have Manami Frost, vegan home cooking with Manami Frost. And I've actually started watching her on YouTube. She has a YouTube channel. Uh, she has a lot of tattoos as well, which you may notice from the cover. 
If, yeah, in fact, yeah, so she has like her, you can't even see really, but her arm, like most of her arm is just black. And she explained in a video why that is. Uh, she has a husband and a daughter as well. They're quite cute. I'm really sad because they're... Uh, Basically, after finishing reading this, I checked out the YouTube channel and watched a bunch of their videos and I wanted to comment, but I can't because YouTube policy, basically because the kid is in it, they like disable comments on videos automatically uh, to like deter would-be pedophiles and stuff. But it's like, it's the most wholesome content ever. <laughs> and I'm, I'm just sad I can't like leave comments and stuff and I don't know, be a part of the world, I guess. But um, yeah, definitely check out their videos. They're like super thought provoking. And the recipes in this were really good as well. I liked the kind of layouts of there's like photos of them all. My only grumble would be that the, the recipes are like alphabetical. So there's no like sections for like starters, mains, desserts or anything like that. It's just alphabetical. So on the one hand, it, I don't know, it makes it easier to look things up. And also it kind of makes it fun to dip in and out of it. But on the other, I guess if you specifically wanted to look for dinner, you, you know, it wouldn't be as convenient. But yeah, I, I, I liked it. I gave it like a four out of five. And I got it for free with um, my vegan kind lifestyle box as well. So that was a, a nice little, that was a nice little win. Okay, here we have Homer. Actually, I'm just going to mention this. I didn't reread this. So this doesn't count towards my overall book count. Uh, Dane, remember that. Also update it in the description, please. Note to editing self. Um, but Homer, Circe and the Cyclops, number 70, uh, ancient Greek myths from the Odyssey telling of battles with deadly beasts and a beautiful enchantress. And the reason I didn't read it is because I read the Odyssey last year, so I've already read it. Okay, then we have Andrei Shevkowski, The Last Wish, probably butchered his name. This is the first Witcher book, or can be the first book, depending upon which order you read the series in. It's a collection of short stories. And uh, when I first picked it up, I wasn't really enjoying it, so I moved it to be like a, a bedtime book, and then I actually enjoyed it a lot more just doing it a little bit at a time. It's quite intense going into this world, especially with no knowledge. I've never played the games or anything like that, so I didn't know any of the lore. And there are a lot of kind of creatures in this that I assume are from uh, Polish mythology that I hadn't heard of, so I, I found it a little bit harder to understand what was going on at times. But I did really like how a lot of these stories are kind of like quite moral stories, and the Witcher is kind of an anti-hero as well, but you can see why he makes a lot of the decisions he makes. But you can also see why he's disliked. So, for example, at one point he kills a bunch of people to stop a larger bunch of people being killed. And then he gets, like, they, like banished from the town. They tell him never to go back. And he's like, well, at least, uh, they, at least they didn't just hang me, I guess. Uh, he also has a little pal in this who's like a bard kind of guy who's very annoying and kind of gets them both into trouble a lot of the time. But makes for kind of a good little side side character i guess so overall i gave this like a 3.5 out of 5 and i probably will read more of the witcher books but i didn't fall in love with it as i was expecting to but um i have fond memories looking back on it so there is that so i probably will go back to it at some point all right i'm gonna have a break my voice is going all right next up we have destination unknown by agatha christie and uh, this one was interesting because it was more like an espionage novel. It almost reminded me of Graham Greene or Ian Fleming or something like that. And uh, it didn't have Poirot or Marple or any of her other well-known characters in it as well. So it was quite an interesting little standalone. It still wasn't her best or anything. And, and it's certainly not the best place to start with her. But I'd give it like a 3.5 out of 5. And uh, for an Agatha Christie fan such as myself, a lot of fun. Then we have uh, Michelle de Montaigne, How We Weep and Laugh at the Same Thing, number 29. Glittering essays by the Renaissance master of the form, exploring contradictions in human thoughts and actions. And basically, this is about how we are all hypocrites and how it's kind of inherently human, I guess. <laughs> and um, but in a good way, you know how that kind of contributes to our survival, I suppose. We have a bunch of different essays in here. So we have the titular essay and then we have on conscience. Fortune is often found in reason's train on punishing cowardice on the vanity of words and to philosophize is to learn how to die which is by far the longest uh, collection uh, piece in this collection. And yeah, it was interesting enough. It was probably like a 3.5 for me. Uh, I might read some more De Montaigne in the future. I wouldn't rule it out, but I, I won't go out of my way for it either. All right, then we have The Miniaturist by Jesse Burton. And I read this as a buddy read with Anthony Andrews. He actually uh, DNF'd it. Uh, but I really enjoyed it. I gave this like a 4.5 out of 5. It's basically historical fiction set in Amsterdam. We have some interesting themes as well. Um, so I don't want to give too much away if you haven't read it. But um, we have some sort of LGBTQ themes in here. We have sort of the the way that society would look down on young and married women if they were to get pregnant and that sort of thing. Some uh, racial themes in here as well. 
and it was just really beautifully written and it did threaten a little bit to become like one of those books where nothing really happened and it did feel quite slow at times but then it was also broken into sections and there was invariably something big happened at the end of each section so just as you were sort of starting to flag you were sort of hitting the face of the next revelation and i think it was done really well so yeah would recommend then we have La La Love by Katie Lewington. So she is kind of an indie poet. I've read some of her work before. I will read you a couple of poems here. Let's go with Tip. And if you are on your mobile phone, laptop or computer, don't forget to stroke their leg under the table while you do check your email. Give them your attention. I see it too often. Couples argue because they feel ignored. All you did was reblog that and reply to this, but you rejected them. Give them love. Let's go with their 4am as well. A longing, wanting, needing, calling, up again, 4am. Cold and dark as my eyes adjust, throwing my blanket around me, thoughts focus on you. What are you doing at this hour? Relieved of my thoughts as I switch on the TV, watching with a tub of ice cream. Are you sleeping? I turn the spoon over. According to my elongated reflection, I rearrange messy strands of hair and pout, blowing kisses. What are you doing? So yeah, I quite like Katie's stuff. I would give this like a, probably a 3.75 out of 5. Uh, I, I appreciate poetry is not for everyone, but it is the kind of poetry that I enjoy. Then we have Tomorrow by Joseph Conrad, number 64. Set in a desolate English port, Conrad's spare, savage, turn of the century story of lives haunted by the sea. Now, unfortunately, that's not really the kind of uh, setting that I'm particularly interested in. So I kind of struggled to keep myself motivated through this one. I did give it a good go though and eventually I took it through as a bedtime book and finished it there. The best I can give it is like a low 3 out of 5. I've read Comrade before and I did enjoy bits of what I read but actually what I've found with him is that I always enjoy his stuff more on a reread as well so maybe I'll give that a go at some point. Okay then we have Julius Caesar and Roman Britain by Eldegard Peach. This is a Ladybird book, it's actually one of the original Ladybird books. Short and sweet, some really nice illustrations as well. Just a history of uh, Roman Britain basically. Uh, I think in this it actually mentioned Watling Street as well, which is a Roman road that um, basically went... Oh, here it is. It's in the map here, look. You can see it there, this big Watling Street is this road here that goes here from Chester all the way down through here, down through St Albans into London. And uh, part of where that street is is in Tamworth, where I grew up. And so there's like a, you know, you can go down Watling Street, which is quite cool. But yeah. And the Romans built it. Very cool. Good work, Romans. Okay, then I went through Philip Pullman's Four Tales, and uh, this is actually a bind up of four books in one. The first one is The Firework Maker's Daughter, which I'd already read, so I didn't reread that. Then we have I Was a Rat or The Scarlet Slippers, Clockwork or All Wound Up, and The Scarecrow and His Servant. And the first two of those I gave like 3.5, and then the fourth one I gave a 4 out of 5. And I think that was also because that fourth one was also longer as well. But they're basically fairy tales, you know? and I don't know. I, I I don't really like fairy tales. Sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. And with these ones, I did like them because they were written by Pullman, but ultimately they didn't really leave much of a mark. And I think probably The Firework Maker's Daughter is actually my favourite of the four stories in this book. All right, then we have Charles Darwin, It Was Snowing Butterflies, number 67. Exotic creatures and unexpected terrains populate Darwin's account of the Beagle's momentous voyage. So obviously this is about Darwin when he went on the voyage with the Beagle. Uh, and I think he was a f physician or a physician's assistant or something. I can't remember now. But um, yeah, then he like formulated many of the ideas that later went into the Origin of Species, which I have read. This is more like travel writing with a bit of nature writing thrown in. And it was really interesting. I mean, it was quite dry, but it was also interesting. You know, it was like um, you need to be prepared going into it to be reading a book on biology, basically, with that kind of archaic language at times. But yeah, I gave it a, a four out of five. All right. Then we have Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, sketchy, doubtful, incomplete jottings. Number 36. The great 19th century German thinkers musings on self-deceit, superstition, art and ambition. And basically a lot of this is pretty much like almost one liners. Little bits that are like food for thought. I'm going to read you a few at random. Beauty is a manifestation of secret natural laws which without this appearance would have remained internally hidden from us. As soon as the ideal makes a demand on the real, it in the end consumes it and also itself. Thus credit, paper money, consumes silver in its own self. Got a slightly longer one. The question, are we to compare or not to compare when considering works of art, is one we would like to answer as follows. The trained connoisseur should make comparisons, for he has a general idea, a preconceived notion of what could be and should be achieved. The amateur, still involved in the process of being educated, 
can make the best progress if he does not compare but judges each achievement on its individual merit. This gradually forms an instinct and idea for the general situation. Comparison by the unknowing is really only a lazy and conceited way of avoiding judgement. Yeah, there was a lot of food for thought in this. Like I said, I'd give this a 4 out of 5 and I'd be interested in reading some more of the author's work. Then we have The Method by Duncan Ralston. I read this for Tarden Danes. Indie read-along. I will link below because I did a full review of this as well. But uh, yeah, I did enjoy this. It's kind of, it's an indie thriller basically. Uh, kind of in the vein of Gone Girl and the Girl on the Train, except I thought done much better. But yeah, this is probably the best thriller I've ever read, or at least the one I enjoyed the most. And it's possibly because it has elements of other genres as well. So, uh, uh, Ralston has written horror before, and you see it, sort of bits of that in there. We get some um, nice sort of intertextuality. One of the bits I really liked as well is one the character is like a fire safety expert. And uh, I should explain, so the method is basically this retreat that couples go on to kind of repair their marriage and he was he was wandering around this uh, retreat and where they were supposed to be living and pointing out all of the uh, you know regulation violations which I thought was cool so yeah a uh, pretty solid four out of five here we have a blink of the screen by Terry Pratchett this is collected short of fiction and this spans most of his career it has some Discworld spin-offs it has some early versions of things like the long war books that he wrote with Stephen Baxter and uh, yeah, it just was just a lot of fun. A lot of these were actually originally published in newspapers around my area because he used to live in uh, Beaconsfield, which is about three, four miles away from me. So it was cool to see that. And again, it's, it covers about 40, 50 years of Pratchett's career. And just if you're a fan of his, you should definitely, you should definitely check this out. Here we have Mary Kingsley, A Hippo Banquet, number 32. The fearless pioneering Victorian female explorer describes dodging elephants and fighting off a leopard with a stool in Africa. So this was worth reading just because of how much of a badass she was. She did have a few kind of things in terms of her beliefs that are maybe a little bit outdated now, kind of a little bit of a colonialist, borderline racist at times, but also she did genuinely have a lot of respect for all of the natives of all the countries that she visited and, and that does come across. So you, there's no malice there if that makes sense. And a lot of it's really beautifully written. There's a lot of, again, of, of nature writing in this. Whether I'd recommend it to everyone, I don't think I would. But again, if you're interested in like strong Victorian women, just yeah, check out Mary Kingsley. I want to know. I like. I don't necessarily want to read more of her stuff, but I want to know more about her. All right, then we have a bedtime book. This is Jaws by Peter Benchley. Uh, everyone pretty much knows what Jaws is about. I actually I have seen the movie a couple of times, but I don't know it well enough to compare it to the book. I've heard that the two are quite different. This reminded me of Stephen King at times. There were also like a few. Got a few troubling bits with this in the way that like women were referred to uh and but it wasn't just i could kind of get past it if it was the characters but it was within the, the actual narrative if that makes sense which kind of pulled me out of the story a bit but i did like it i also liked how bleak the ending was it, it was one of those where it took me a while to get into it but the more i read it the more i enjoyed it and uh yeah i mean it was fine i i if you're into like horror and stuff check it out but otherwise probably you know it's, it's just all right Okay, so here we have a good housekeeping step-by-step -step vegetarian cookbook. I got this for like a pound at a car boot sale. Honestly, it's like a two out of five. I think there are only two or three recipes I took from this. I was thinking I could veganize the recipes because obviously they're vegetarian, but I could use like vegan cheeses and milk and this kind of stuff. Stop meowing, cat. I'm reviewing. But it turns out there actually weren't that many recipes in here that I wanted to try anyway. And so I was kind of disappointed by it. So yeah, two out of five. Then I read Ian Fleming, Thunderball. So I thought I'd read all the Bond novels, but this one, I'd missed this one out for some reason. I did enjoy it. It wasn't the best. It's probably like a 3.75 out of five. Obviously the Bond novels are a little bit dated now compared to when they were first released, but I still think they're worth reading. I think Bond is uh, an interesting protagonist. And uh, yeah, I'd suggest checking it out. All right, which way around does this go? I guess this way around. This is uh, Death Note Black Edition Volume 1, story by Sugumi Oba, art by Takeshi Obata. It's my first experience with manga, so obviously reading right to left. I am familiar with the Death Note story. I've seen like the Japanese movies and the like American uh, blasphemy that was released via Netflix so I kind of know the story already so I gave it like a 4.5 out of 5 and really the only reason for it not to get that full 5 out of 5 was that there was nothing that took me by surprise in it but perhaps that will happen later on because I kind of don't really remember it that well but as I was reading it it was all coming back to me you know and I think I'm probably going to get a box set of these because I have this and number three but I don't have two four five and six so I think I'm going to get the box set and then give my spare copies to Bex. Then we have The Mist in the Mirror by Susan Hill. So Susan Hill obviously wrote The Woman in Black. And I'd actually put off reading this for a while because I'd 
basically a few of my friends I'd heard through them that um, that like two of them had met Susan Hill at different times and both of them had said she wasn't particularly nice or easy to get on with so I guess that kind of put me off reading more of her work and I've had this on my TBR for a while now finally picked it up and it was great this is another 4.5 out of 5 really good job at like building this kind of creepy atmosphere it was very similar to the woman in black in that both of them kind of follow sort of a young man as he delves into the past and is kind of haunted by it as well and um yeah i just thought it was really really well done and if you're into sort of that that kind of victorian ghost story vibe definitely check it out then we have elizabeth gaskell the old nurse's story penguin little black classic number 39 a ghostly child roams the Northumberland moors, while fairy tale characters gather at a strange party in these two Victorian Gothic tales. So that first story I wasn't particularly interested in. The second one was a lot more interesting when basically this guy gets lost at night and then he kind of seeks shelter at this house. And it turns out to be, yeah, like a dinner party with all these fairy tale creatures gathering there. So it was on par for like a, a, a three out of five maybe. But that story, that second story brought it up to like a 3.5. I would read more Gaskell in the future, but I wouldn't, like, I'm in no rush, I guess. But, um, yeah, again, if you're interested, if you want to read more kind of classic women in, in uh, fiction and whatnot, then uh, check her out. Then we have The God Delusion by Richard Dawkins. So I actually started listening to this via audiobook. It was a reread. And I started listening in November. And then basically what kept happening is my phone kept dying while I was listening to it. And then it would like, revert back to further back than I was before I even started. So I kept listening to the same bits over and over again. And eventually I just decided, you know what, I'm going to finish off listening to it. So I did. I gave it a 4 out of 5. I have filmed a review for it, which isn't out yet, but maybe out at some point. And uh, yeah, it's, it was, again, a reread. It was a 5 out of 5 for my first time, 4 out of 5 in the second time, but still very interesting. Lots of interesting debates. I took loads of notes and that kind of stuff. And it was also read by Richard Dawkins as well, which was pretty cool. Then we have Gooseberries by, or Gooseberries by Anton Chekhov, number 34. Chekhov perfected the short story, as showed in these three moving miniature dramas of love, dread and lies. Now, unfortunately, while I could appreciate that the writing was, you know, very well done, I just wasn't that engaged with these stories, so I didn't particularly enjoy them. I, I don't know, I'd give it like a three out of five. It's probably one of the weaker uh, story collections so far, which I think is kind of interesting when it says that he perfected the short story, and I'm like, well... There wasn't evidence of it here, unfortunately, but, um, you know. Here we have Romeo and Juliet by Sonia Leong. So this is a manga version of Romeo and Juliet. It's set in Tokyo in, like, the modern day, so it's a bit reminiscent of Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet movie. It uses most of the original dialogue, and so it's kind of a weird juxtaposition because at some points it just feels as though you're reading the original Romeo and Juliet and that that's when it's set, you know, and then suddenly they go into a club and there's, like... Yakuza's gangbanging and stuff as in like, you know pew, 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 Not as in, you know, yeah, I, I gave it like it was like 3.5 out of 5 It would be good if you had a kid who was into manga and he was studying Shakespeare at school But as somebody who like I like Shakespeare more than manga, I guess I don't know They just didn't mesh too well for me. Then we have the Department for Transport the official highway code This is another reread of this for me And uh, this was in preparation for taking my driving theory test, which I passed hooray uh, so now I just need to pass my actual practical test, which may, may take a little longer. But yeah, uh, reread number three of this. I mean, it is what it is. It's like a 3.5 out of 5. Uh, maybe maybe I'm going to be generous and give it a 4 out of 5 because I passed. So it did its job. Then we have The Good Man Jesus and the Scoundrel Christ by Philip Pullman. This is basically like a retelling of the story of Jesus, except that Jesus has a brother called Christ. And it kind of follows the two of them and it, it sort of subverts what the biblical stories are, but I think in quite interesting ways. So for example, there was the story of the feeding of the 5,000 and what actually happened was that once Jesus started sharing the food that he had, everybody else started sharing the little bits of food that they had and eventually there was enough to go round. And I think that's a really quite a powerful like message. It's almost more powerful than the original story. Now it's come under fire a lot from like religious groups and whatnot and I can kind of see why, but personally I'm an atheist, so I don't really care. And on the back it says, this is a story. And I think you should see it as a story, you know? And it's one of the few retellings I've read that I actually enjoyed it. I gave it a 4.5 out of 5, food for thought. Then we have The Boy in the Striped Pajamas by John Boyne, which despite being very popular, I unfortunately didn't like. I gave it a 2 out of 5. I thought the, 
writing was okay in places, but so I did this full review of it and I did a rant about it, I guess, in my uh, reading vlog as well. Basically, none of it seemed to make sense to me. So, for example, I don't understand that this, that, um, what was his name, Bruno, could have spent day after day talking through a fence to a Jew kid in Auschwitz, especially when there was a hole there that they could fit through. I don't understand why this kid didn't run away. I don't understand where the guards were. At the end, the Nazis just rounded up a random bunch of people and gassed them, and I don't understand why they weren't focusing on, like, the weak and the unfit to work. I don't understand how this kid was living, he was a nine-year-old kid living in Berlin in 1942 and hadn't heard of Hitler. For me, that's like, if you've got a nine-year-old kid living in London now and they hadn't heard of the Queen, you'd be like, what is going on? So, I don't know, I just didn't like it, unfortunately. So yeah, two out of five. Then we have C.P. Cavafy, Remember Body, Little uh, Penguin, Little Black Classic number 43. Moving sensual verses on nostalgia and desire by the masterful early 20th century Greek poet. And what's interesting about these is that from, I understand anyway, I think he was a homosexual, <laughs> is that the term we use these days? Um, but obviously at a time when it was um, frowned upon, and it's kind of covered in some of these these uh, poems. I'm just going to read you a couple of them at random. We'll go with the, uh, the tobacconist's window. Near the brightly lit window of a tobacconist shop, they stood amid a crowd of people. By chances their gazes met, and hesitantly they half expressed the illicit longing of their flesh. Later, after several anxious steps along the pavement, they smiled and gently nodded. Then the closed carriage, the sensuous mingling of their bodies, the hands, the lips coming together. We'll do one more. In despair. He's lost him for good, and now on the lips of each new lover, he seeks the lips of the one he lost. In every embrace with each new lover, he tries to believe that he's giving himself to the same young man. He's lost him for good, as if he'd never existed. The boy wished, so he said. He wished to be freed from the stigma and reproach of that unhealthy pleasure from the stigma and reproach of that shameful pleasure. It wasn't too late, he said, for him to break free. He'd lost him for good as if he'd never existed, through imagination and self-delusion. He seeks those lips on the lips of others. He's trying to feel that lost love again. So yeah, three out of five for me. Um, uh, sorry, 3.5 out of five for me, pretty good. Um, not necessarily my style of poetry that I'm into, but I, I did, I appreciate the subject matter as well, actually. I thought it was really well done. And then finally for now, I will come back, as I said, in a few days and finish this off. But uh, this is 30 Days of Vegan by Catherine Kid RD. And again, with my recipe books, I don't consider them to be read until I've gone through and tried all the recipes I'm interested in. This one didn't have a huge amount. And actually, the bulk of this is like a meal plan. So for your first 30 days as a vegan, which I didn't bother following because it wasn't my first 30 days as a vegan. And also, I don't think meal plans tend to work that well because like... I don't know, I'd go out and unexpected things happen and you deviate and then, like, I don't like having a plan and not sticking to it, I don't know, more than 90%. But yeah, there were one or two good recipes in here that I did enjoy for what it was. It was alright, I also got it on a discount. I assume it was, like, released to tie in with Veganuary and then I got it in, like, February, March and so that's why it was discounted. It was, like, a 3 out of 5 and, uh, yeah, that's, that's where we're at. So yeah, I am up to date with my reading and I will see you shortly. Uh, handing over to Future Day now. All right, Future Day is here and this is the last little bit for my March wrap up. I have, I think, four more books. So I will film these off and uh, edit it all down, get it uploaded and we'll see how many books I actually read, which would be very interesting. But uh, yes, so we'll start with this one. This is Station 17 Chronicles by Ollie Jacobs. This is an indie book. Basically, it all sets, it's all set in a, uh, like a research laboratory that's kind of pretty much at, like at the end of the world, you know, and strange things happen at this place, like people who spend time there go a little bit crazy, and this book has, uh, it says like three stories, it's basically two novellas and one really short story at the end uh, that take place at Station 17, so uh, in the second one, which I think was my favourite one, the CEO of the company goes along and he gets convinced that people there have rot, and so he's trying to kill them all to stop the spread of this rot uh, and the third one is kind of like just basically a description of the station as it lies abandoned there you know um, there were some good bits to this and there were some bad bits I gave this like a three out of five there were a lot of typos and spelling mistakes that really took me out of this one and I just think the whole thing could either have been shorter or that they could have all been integrated into one longer novel potentially 
Um, something about it just didn't agree with me, unfortunately. And that's a shame because I really do like Ollie's books. And I think just, just this is like my least favorite one of like eight of them now or something. But um, I would still definitely recommend checking out his work. Then we have a couple of Penguin Little Black classics. So we have The Yellow Wallpaper, number 42 by Charlotte, uh, Charlotte Perkins Gilman. This horrifying semi-autobiographical feminist story of imprisonment and madness scandalized 19th century society. And there are two stories in this. Or were there three? Let me check. There are three. There's the yellow wallpaper, the rocking chair, and old water. The yellow wallpaper is probably the best of them. And it's basically about this woman who has been kind of emotionally manipulated by her partner into believing that she's going mad when she's actually going mad because he's an asshole. So that's kind of, I guess, where the feminist part of this comes in. The other two weren't as good, but all overall, like, the writing style was pretty good. I'd give it a 3.5 out of 5 and would definitely read some of her stuff. Um, I do think the yellow wallpaper is, like, her most famous and most sort of critically acclaimed story though so I don't know whether I've peaked or not but we'll, we'll see. Then we have Herman Melville the Maldive Shark number 38. Dark nightmarish sea stories and poems inspired by Melville's adventures around the world's oceans in a whaler and I actually thought this was non-fiction until I just read that so maybe it's not non-fiction. It's basically just stories about nature with some poems in them. Um, the poems are actually better than the prose I thought. Melville kind of really overwrites stuff and he took a subject matter that I was kind of interested in and just really bored the, the pants off me. So I gave it a 2 out of 5. And now I'm really dreading Moby Dick because I do have a copy of that. And like the guy's, the guy's writing style just... Well, I mean, he was a whaler, not a writer. That's how I see it. It's like if you took a random dude now who worked on an oil rig and got them to write a book, it probably wouldn't be very good because they work on an oil rig. They're not writers. I don't I don't know. Uh, and then we have Holes by Louis Sackar. And uh, this is basically, this reminded me of The Long Walk by Stephen King. And it's basically like a group of sort of delinquent kids. They're all being forced to dig these holes that are five feet by five feet by five feet. And uh, they have to dig a new hole each day. And it's kind of done as like character building and punishment, or at least to begin with. But as the novel goes on, we start to see this backstory behind what, what's really being dug for. And it all ties in together quite nicely. But I just didn't like that story as much as the, the actual focus of this as being, you know, the, the, you know, the penal system and how they, you know... Uh, so basically this kid, the, the main character we follow, he was accused of stealing some trainers that he didn't even steal. And then he was given the choice of either going to uh, going to dig these holes or going to jail, basically. I said in uh, in my vlog, it's, it's like, getting, like sending a kid to the ranch on Dr. Phil. So, yeah, I liked it. The first half of it was, I thought it was going to be a 5 out of 5. And it was at, at the very least a 4.5 out of 5. But then the second half, I didn't like as much. So overall, I gave it a 4 out of 5. But it was a very good book. And I would certainly recommend reading it. Especially if you like things like um, like The Outsiders by Essie Hinton. It's kind of in that vein, I guess. Almost like kind of forerunners to today's YA. Yeah, there we have it. That is what I read in March. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read any of these books. And if so, what you thought of them. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more. And I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.